All right, let's look to God in the word of prayer and we'll begin. Now our gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the rule book that you've given us, the word of God. Lord, we look into the rule book and we find out that uh, which is the ingredients of a successful marriage. And Lord, we uh, have to confess, Lord, that uh, as a people, as a nation, that we have forsaken the word. And Lord, we see the result of it today. Marriage is falling apart on all sides, both Christian and non-Christian. And so Lord, as we uh, dig deeper into this uh, marital union that was made in Eden, Lord, we pray that it might be fresh truth brought to our own understanding and into our own hearts, Lord, that we may apply to our own lives. Now glorify your name in this study time together. May Jesus be exalted, we pray in his precious name. Amen. Okay, be, before we get into the lesson this morning, I got a correction from something I said last week. We were talking about illegitimate births, and I made the statement that Ill, the illegitimate birth rate in America has now surpassed 50%. Uh, turns out that was not correct. Um, this is the article that I was reading from, okay? And it reads here now that in France, 50.5% uh, of the births are illegitimate. And in Sweden, Norway, Estonia, and Bulgaria, it's over 50%. In the United Kingdom, it's 44%. That was back in the year 2006. And even in Catholic countries like Italy and Spain, uh, it has doubled. It's still low by comparison, 27% uh, in Italy and 17% in Spain, but it has doubled over the last decade. So then coming to the United States, uh, our our illegitimate birth rate is 36.9, or almost 37%. So I was mistaken there. I thought it said that we had a 50, over a 50% illegitimate birth rate, but that uh, we're not quite that bad yet. We're on our way. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> a marriage made in Eden. So we saw last week rule number one for marriage. And rule number one for marriage is one man, one woman, one flesh that lasts one lifetime. This is what God has decreed. And you remember when the Pharisees came to Jesus and they asked him about divorce and they said, why did Moses allow divorce? And Jesus tells them it was because of the hardness of your hearts that he permitted it. He was not in favor of it, but this was, God was being gracious. He permitted it, but it was never the plan of God. And then Jesus takes them all the way back to the Garden of Eden. He says, from the beginning, it was not so. And he takes them back to Eden and says, and that's where he quotes from the book of Genesis, where uh, man and woman, they, are, they come together and they become one flesh. So rule number one, one man, one woman, one flesh for one lifetime. Rule number two is what we're going to consider today. Rule number two is leave and cleave. Leave and cleave. Genesis 2.24. And we have four things that we want to draw your attention to from this verse. I'm going to first of all read it. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. First of all, it says he is to leave his father and his mother. And as we mentioned last week, the bond between the husband and wife is to be stronger than the bond between parents and children. And many times that is not so. There are many marriages in which either the husband or the wife are still tied to the apron strings of the parents. And it's a bad situation. God says, leave and cleave. And that doesn't mean just leave physically, although uh, it's, it's, that's what the verse is talking about here, but emotionally and spiritually as well. Leave, and be, you're gonna be on your own here now. Uh, leave his father and his mother. And then the second thing in this verse is 
cleave. And cleave means to glue, to glue together. A husband and wife, they cleave, they, they're glued together. We're going to see a great example of that in just a little bit here. They shall cleave, and I'll notice it says, he shall cleave unto his wife. That's his own wife, not somebody else's. And it doesn't say he shall cleave unto a woman. It has to be his wife. And the fourth thing we read here, and this is the reason for it all, they shall become one flesh. Now that word leave means to abandon, to desert, and to forsake. And you know, God has given us some excellent examples in the animal kingdom. In the animal kingdom, probably the greatest bond that there is is between a, mo a mother and her babies, whether it's a bird or a, 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 a bear or a, a wolf or dog, whatever it is, the, 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 the strongest bond there is between the mother and her babies. The mother will lay down her life to protect those babies. She'll do anything for them. And she sees that they're fed, and she sees that they're cared for, and she po will protect them, and she'll fight anybody, any predator that comes after them, no matter how big or strong or how many. She'll do anything for those babies until they reach a certain point in their life. And when they reach that certain point, it's bye-bye. We're all done. And it's just like that, that bond just disappears. In, in fact, in the case of eagles, the little eaglet is up there in the nest and they build their nest way up high. And uh, when the mother eagle decides the time has come to break that, that union, she pushes them out of the nest. They better learn how to fly because uh, uh, she pushes them right out, right out of the nest. And all of this mother-child relationship is all ended at that point. And so we have a lesson from nature here. To leave means to simply leave, to, to abandon, to desert, or to forsake. Mother and father cleave unto this wife, and they shall be one flesh. Because they're one flesh, they establish one home. And they even have now one name. Do you know that's in the Bible? God called them, it says, in... Um, uh, I forget it's Genesis 4 or 5. It says he called them Adam. He called them Adam. Mr. Adam and Mrs. Adam. Her name was Eve, but she became Mrs. Adam. God called them Adam. She, she takes the name of her husband. Why? Because she has left her parents and has cleaved unto her husband. To the point where she is one flesh and one name. And so they establish one home, and they now become one unit, unified together. Now we called this lesson, Cleave Not Cleavage. And this is the one thing that totally destroys this concept, God's concept of marriage. Here's a, here's a question for you. Here's a question. What does Every TV show, doesn't matter if it's a situation comedy, a drama, quiz show, mystery program, even a football game, a soap opera, and even the commercials. What do they all have in common? You can you see cleavage. Check it out. It's true. And we have, uh, I'm sure you've noticed, if you're a man, you've noticed. <laughs> if you're a man and you haven't noticed, just forget the rest of what we're going to say here this morning. <laughs> but a man notices that stuff. And shameless women dress this way to get your attention and to attract you. They, somebody, a sponsor or whatever the purpose is, they want to sexually attract the audience. And to make men to lust after what they're seeing on the TV screen, to weaken that marital un unit, to weaken that, that, uh, uh, that home where the two have come together and have become one flesh. Now here's the thing, that woman that you see up there on the screen, chances are she's going to look better, 
and dress better and have her hair, not a hair out of place, and she's going to act better. She's going to be all smiles and perky and so forth. And right away there's a psychological uh, comparison there between the, ma uh, the, the one on the screen and his wife. And usually the wife comes in second place. And this is used to weaken and destroy the marriages which are destroyed according to the article we read. Uh, almost 37% uh, of, of uh, births are out of wedlock and marriages are falling apart at such a rapid rate. And so um, one flesh plus one more person who looks and acts and dresses better is a destructive force that is shamelessly being exploited in this country to weaken and to destroy uh, marriages. Now, God says leave your parents. Very, very important. It doesn't work. I know a lot of times, well, we want to save money, so we're going to move in together. Ooh, don't do that. Now, I know it's just a temporary thing, but many a marriage has been really weakened or wrecked because of that. So leave, it says, and cleave to his wife, and uh, they become one flesh. Now in John chapter 4, Jesus meets a woman from Samaria. He meets her at the well, and he offers to her eternal life. And in John 4:14, 4, Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. What's Jesus talking about here? He's talking about salvation, eternal life. Drink of this water and you'll never thirst. But the water that I should give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. He's talking, self, uh, talking about salvation uh, to this woman. And he equates the salvation experience to the quenching of thirst with the everlasting living waters of God. Okay, the Bible says, blessed are he that hungers and thirsts after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Many people are hungering and thirsting after righteousness, and God promises to fulfill it. Well, here he's promising to quench the thirst, the spiritual thirst of this woman. And the woman responds in the affirmative here, but notice what, what she's got in mind. Verse 15, the woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water. And she names two reasons why she wants it. Number one, that I thirst not. Okay, this is legitimate because if you back up to John 4:14, 4, he said, whosoever drinketh of the water I give him shall never thirst. Okay, she heard that part of it. So she says, give me this water that I thirst not. Then her second reason is, neither come hither to draw. It's hard work going to a well and drawing water out of a well. Whether you've got a bucket that you lower down into it or, or a pitcher uh, you, you know, that you dip into it, uh, water is heavy. And after you, you get it up, then you've got to carry it back to, to your home. It's a lot of work there. And she says, give me this water that I thirst not and neither come hither to draw. Now what's she thinking about? She's thinking about H2O. Jesus isn't talking about H2O. He's talking about living waters. He's talking about everlasting life. He's talking to her about salvation. So what does he do here? There's a real lesson in soul winning here that he uses with this woman. So he says to her, instead of telling her how to be saved, instead he does something else that is very necessary. Verse 16, Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. Go call your husband and come here. Now, why would he do that? For what purpose? Well, we know from the story that she's had a string of husbands, okay? So he says, go call your husband. He hits a sore spot with her. You see, the Bible teaches us, in fact, I'm going to read you the verse. It's from Acts chapter 20 and verse 21. The scripture says, testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. The ingredients of salvation is repentance towards God, a sorrow for sin, and secondly, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in the day and age in which we're living, repentance has kind of been put on the back burner. 
We don't talk to people about sin anymore, but Jesus did. He's going to talk to this woman about sin, her own personal sin in her life. And so he says to her, go call your husband. And verse 17 and 18, she replies, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And she's perfectly willing to leave it right there. I have no husband. Okay. In other words, she's saying to Jesus, well, I'm, I'm single or maybe I'm a widow or whatever, but I don't, I don't have a husband. And Jesus saith, saith unto her, said unto her, thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast is not thy husband. That is, he is not your legitimate husband. In that saidst thou truly. So this woman has had five husbands. Now, who officiated? Remember that we talked about this last week? Who officiated at Adam and Eve's wedding? Who officiated at, this, at these multiple marriages of this woman? The answer is nobody. She's had five husbands because she has gone and lived together with five different men. Now, that can be five at a time or one at a time, one through five, but this, the bottom line is the same thing, that uh, she's had five different husbands. She has been intimate with five different husbands. She has been one flesh with five different husbands, making a total mockery of the marital union of, of one man, one woman, and one flesh for one lifetime. And not only, had, <coughs> pardon me, not only has she had five husbands, but she's working on number six right now. And she says, and he, he says that the one you have right now is not your husband, meaning he's not your, your, legitimate, your legitimate husband. And so just think, now this woman, because that's what consummates the marital union, she has become one flesh with six different men. And Jesus boldly talks to her about her sin here. Did you know that's what got John the Baptist in trouble? He goes into King Herod and he says, it's not lawful for you to have your brother Philip's wife. And what happened? He lost his head. They, had, they, they cut his head off. People don't want to hear about their sin, okay? So, but Jesus talks to this woman about her sin. And she's been one flesh with five men. And she's got number six there in, in, in tow now. And so at, she's been cleaving to number six, who legally she was not married to, uh, enjoy, in, 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 engaged in a physical union without a marital contract. Now, when Jesus says this to her, she knew that it was sin that he was talking about. Now that makes her a little bit smarter than many people in America and around the world in this present generation because we have been taught by the world, unfortunately, that there's nothing wrong with this. Just go on and, and if it don't work the first time, try it again. If that don't work, try it again and again and again until it does. The Hollywood type, type of, uh, of, of marriages here. Okay, so um, she knows that he is talking to her about sin. And the reason we know that is she changes the subject. You know, when you talk to a sinner about sin in their life, you tell them, you know, your sin has separated you from God. They always want to change the subject and talk about religion. And that's what this woman did. She says, oh, well, she says, um, uh, you Jews, you say that uh, Jerusalem is the proper place to worship. But uh, us Samaritans, we believe Mount Gerizim is the, is the proper place. Now, now, what do you say about it? She wanted to talk religion. And this, this, is a, this is an old ploy. When you get a sinner there, you're, you're witnessing to them and telling them about Jesus and they're under conviction. First thing they want to do is change the subject and they figure the best subject to change it to is something that's kind of close. So they talk about religion. Oh yeah, you know, I went to confirmation class and, yeah, and I was confirmed and I was baptized and, and, and all of that business. They, they'll, talk, they'll talk religion. Well, it didn't work with Jesus. And... Uh, so um, uh, he, he tells her, you know, to, to call her husband. And uh, ultimately, this woman here, she gets saved. So to cleave is much more than a physical union. 
It's much more than physical. It is, it's a spiritual union. It is an emotional union. It is a mental union. It, it's much more than that. You know, the reason that uh, God created Eve was, was not to satisfy uh, Adam's sexual appetite primarily. It was because he said it's not good for man to dwell alone. That, you know, is for companionship. That was, the, that was the ultimate goal. Now we have again an excellent example in, from nature in the animal kingdom about cleaving together. And did you ever hear of the anglerfish? There's a picture of the anglerfish. The anglerfish lives deep, deep down in the ocean. In fact, he lives so deep down in the ocean that it's pitch black down there, you can't see anything. And if you notice up, that little thing up on, uh, on growing out of his uh, head is, has phosphorus in it and it's a light. It lights up where he goes, or in this case, where she goes, because that's a her, okay? Did you know that was a female fish right there? You can tell by the mouth, it's open. Anyways, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyways, you say, what is this over here? Well, I can tell you a love story here about the anglerfish. The anglerfish, the male, when he's looking for a mate, he spies her. He's got a little light, too, in his head. He spots her. And you heard about guys hitting on a woman. When he hits on her, it is a real hit because he comes with his mouth wide open and those long, sharp teeth, and he bites her right on the side. Just like he's, he's hanging on there right now, okay? And he never lets go. He's there for life. She's got to carry him around for life, okay? You know, when she talks to the other lady angler fish, you know, they talk about her marriage, she probably says, yeah, he's a real drag, you know? <laughs> but he, he bites into her side and does not let go and a strange thing begins to happen. Their, um, uh, all, of their, all of their bodily functions begin to merge together. Their circulatory system merges together. Their digestive system uh, murders, uh, uh, mur murders, merges together. Uh, she has to, like a mother, she has to eat for two, only she's got to feed her husband because he, he can't eat anymore. He's, he's clung right to the side of her. And uh, so she has to eat and he gets the benefit from it. And this is the way they go through life. He has taken cle a cleaving to the ultimate uh, point here. He cl they cleave together. So that's, a, uh, that's an example from nature. Well, God's purpose for creating Eve was not limited to sexual fulfillment. It was to, for Adam's loneliness, for companionship. Genesis 2.18, it is not good that man should live alone. And in the 23rd verse, he says it again. Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And so the marital union is patterned after Christ and his church. Think of this anglerfish and think of Christ and his church. The Bible says, for we are members, this is Ephesians 5, 30 through 33, for we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, this is quoting from Genesis chapter two, shall leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife and the two shall be one flesh. That's what we read in Genesis. But the scripture goes on here and says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and his church. Jesus patterned the relationship of himself and his church after the marital relationship. They are to cleave one to another. And it goes on and states, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. 
Husbands are to love their wives, and wives are to reverence their husband. They do this when cleaving together. Now, there's an admonition here for parents as well as to the bride and bridegroom. To the parents, the admonition is choose and lose. You say, what does that mean? Well, back in biblical times, almost all your marriages were arranged marriages. They were arranged by the parents. And that means that your spouse will, is going to be picked out by your parents. How would you like that system today? Well, you know there's some parts of the world where they still do this. And guess what? Their divorce rate is practically zilch. Why is that? Because the parents got more sense than the kids. How old are people when they usually get married? You know, they're in their early, early 20s. They still got heads full of mush, you know? They haven't, haven't got their feet, they've just only just become officially adults, you know? And um, uh, they haven't really tasted of life. They, they, they don't know what, it, what it's like. And um, the parents are older and wiser, and they can see things that, uh, that the young people can't see sometimes. And you say, but um, uh, an arranged marriage isn't built on love. Did we read anything about love in any of this? No, God didn't say that, not right away. What the scripture does say is concerning the wife that she learn to love her husband. Love is a learned thing. You learn to love your husband. And many times in an arranged marriage, the bride and bridegroom don't even know each other. But they have to stick it out. It's their parents' will. Their parents on both sides have arranged it. And they have to stick it out. And they learn to love one another. Now we say, oh, well, you know, we, we have the Hollywood concept today. Uh, we, we, we meet, boy meets girl, we fall in love and get married. You know, I really question that, that, they, that uh, with, with the divorce rate, what it is today, that people are in love. You know, but I love her. I, I, I love him. We're, we're in love. You know, I challenge that. In heat, maybe, but not in love. Because... Love is something you have to learn. And as you learn it more and more, they, they cleave, cleave together. And so to the parents, the admonition is choose and lose. For the husband and the wife, it's leave and cleave. And this union of one flesh is to be for life. Notice at the bottom of the page what Jesus said, Matthew 19, 6. Wherefore they are no more twain, or two, but one flesh. Okay, one flesh, so what? what God, therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Now this obsession that we talked about with the cleavage, that is so prevalent today, a product cannot be advertised without a half-naked woman involved in it someplace or other. Uh, I mean, it's in the commercials, it's in the, on the programs, it doesn't matter what kind of a program it is, it's in the, it's in the, uh, the magazines, you know. <laughs> uh, well, anyways, um, this is, a, is borderline pornography. And pornography is a wicked, wicked, wicked sin. And the problem with pornography is it cleaves to you. We have had people, I've known people, have been addicted to pornography. There's been some right in this church have been addicted to pornography. And it cleaves to you, just like craving for dope to a dope addict, just like you're craving for drink to an alcoholic, just like the craving for nicotine to a smoker. It cleaves to you, and it never satisfies. It never brings any satisfaction. It just brings more and more lust all the time. Now, the Bible says in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 17, 
God says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, and thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. He says, don't look, don't lust, and don't covet. In 1 Corinthians 6.18, Paul writes, flee fornication. Flee fornication. Why? Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. How do you sin against your own body? Because you have become, if you're a married person, you have become one flesh with your wife, and you're sinning against your own body by uh, looking and lusting uh, uh, concerning, concerning fornication. You can commit fornication with a thought, with a look, or with the act itself. So he says, flee fornication. And you know why it says that, to flee? Because there is no defense against it. Now we have three enemies as Christians, the world, the flesh, and the devil. There's a defense against the devil. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Okay, so we can defend against the devil. He's not our most powerful uh, enemy. And then there is the world. And what is the defense against the world? The Bible says that uh, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. So by faith we can overcome the world. You, uh, the world with all its allurements and enchantments and so forth should have no power over the Christian. We can defeat the world by faith. But the flesh is the most powerful enemy that we have. And there is no defense against it. God says there's only one thing to do, and that is flee. You find yourself in a compromising situation, flee. You find yourself being tempted in some way or other, flee. Don't say, well, I'm strong enough. No, you're not. There's nobody that is strong enough. And so the word of God, the, the defense here is simply, simply to flee. Remember Joseph, Potiphar's wife's coming after Joseph. What does he do? Flees. He took off. And uh, this is what David should have done with Bathsheba. But instead, uh, he, he calls her home and, and set off a, <coughs> a whole chain reaction of uh, God's judgment, all because of that, of that one thing. In 2 Timothy 2.22, it says, flee also youthful lusts. Flee youthful lusts. Now, that's not talking just to young people. Youthful lusts is not confined just to young people. They're confined to older people as well. <laughs> you know, just because there's some snow on the roof doesn't mean that there's not fire in the furnace. And, and so, youthful lusts, we, we have a number of examples of that in the in, uh, in America today. The mayor of Detroit should have flee, fled from youthful lusts. He's not a youth, but he should have fled from youthful lusts. The ex-governor of New York, Spitzer, he should have fled from youthful lusts. And the former president of the United States on numerous occasions should have fled from youthful lusts. And now I see in the paper the husband of our Senator Debbie Stabenow, uh, he should have fled from youthful lusts. It, it seems like this is, it, it, this is a sin that is, that is all over the place today. And he says, flee from those youthful lusts. Don't give them a chance. The Bible says, don't give place to the devil, but it also says, don't, uh, don't give the, the flesh an opportunity here. You see a situation developing, flee. You see yourself being left alone together with someone of the opposite sex, flee. If you see uh, any kind of a situation, get out of there, flee. That's what the exhortation from the Word of God is. James chapter one and verse 14 to 15, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lusts. What happens after his own lust? Well, the scripture says he's enticed. He becomes enticed. And then what happens? Then when lust hath conceived, that is, it's brought forth, it bringeth forth sin. The world doesn't want to hear about sin. Uh, they don't care. Hearing, it's okay to hear about lust. It's okay to hear about this, that, and the other thing. But 
It says, lust, when it conceives, brings forth sin. It is sin in the eyes of God. It bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. The wages of sin is death. So many times, unfortunately, in this day and age in which we're living, Christians allow the world to set the standard for them. Many Christians are living by the standard set by the world out there. And the trouble with the standard that is set by the world is that it is constantly, continuously changing. It doesn't stay the same. Um, when I was a boy in this country, when I was a boy, the, the, the moral standard of the country was very, very near that of the biblical standard. But in, during my lifetime, I've seen it just gradually and rapidly deteriorate. And so people are they're having their standards set by the world. We need to let the, the Word of God set our standards for us because this is who we're going to, uh, going to answer to. All right? So lust and covetousness are sins of the flesh and are prompted by Satan many times, are prompted by Satan. Now in Exodus 32, 6, it's talking here about a religious gathering. Oh, this is a gathering of religious people. It says, they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And then it says, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And that says in, the, in verse 25, and when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked and their, and their shame was among their enemies. This was a religious gathering. It started out offering sacrifices and it wound up in orgy. Just because you meet someone in a religious setting, a Bible study or some such thing, it doesn't mean it can't happen to you. That nobody is immune to it. That's why God says, flee fornication. Now, here's a lesson on how to insult your wife in the worst possible way that you can do it. Here's the worst thing that you can do. Look and lust at pornography. You cannot slap her in the face, hit her any harder, do any mean thing that that is any worse than that. And there are many husbands that are doing it and it is destroying marriages in this country left and right. And the word of God tells us in Job chapter 31, Job says, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? This is the beginning, uh, the look. It begins with a look. That's why you have this, all this stuff on television. It begins with a look. And then it passes from the eyes to the mind, to the brain. And you begin to think about it. He says, why should I think upon a maid? Because, as we said, fornication can be committed with a look or a thought or the deed itself. Matthew 5.28, Jesus said, I say unto you that whosoever looketh, here's the look here, here's the thought, think upon a maid, here's the look, whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in, his heart, in her heart, his heart. Just by, just by a, a look, a thought, uh, th this, this sin can be, uh, can be uh, committed. So, you're spiritually, in, in the case of pornography, a person is spiritually becoming one flesh with a picture or some such thing as that. You know, uh, pornography is not some new thing. We visited a number of years ago, we were over in Greece and we were going through the ancient city of Ephesus and that's Ephesus where Paul preached. And did you know that place was filled with pornography? And Throughout ancient Greece, we went to the museum there in Athens. It's filled with pornography. That, that nation was a degenerate nation in so many different, different ways. And it's no wonder that they, that they collapsed. Well, he says here, um, uh, not, to, uh, not to think or look 
upon a woman. In Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 16, it's talking about the day of the Lord. And it's a whole long list of things on which the judgment of God is going to fall on the day of the Lord. That's at Jesus' second coming, when he comes back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them who know not God. And it's what it says in, in Isaiah 2.16 here. It says that this judgment at the day of the Lord is going to be upon all the ships of Tarshish. And then it says, and upon all pleasant pictures. And that phrase, pleasant pictures, literally means pictures of desire. In other words, pornography. God's judgment is going to be upon the pornography and the pornographer. They're going to be judged. There's a special judgment for those that propagate th uh, this terrible sin. When Israel had to go in and conquer the land of Canaan, in the book of Numbers, chapter 33, here's what God tells them to do. You shall drive out the inhabitants of the land before you and destroy all their pictures. Why should they destroy all their pictures? Is he talking here about portraits? No. Is he talking here about landscape? No. What kind of pictures is he talking about? It's obvious from the context. He's talking about pornographic pictures and he says, destroy them. Have nothing to do with them. And here's the reason why. We're talking about cleaving, right? The man and the husband cleaving to, to one another. Pornography cleaves to a person. Psalm 101 and verse three. He says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. And look what it says. It shall not cleave to me. The uh, wicked thing that was set before his eyes, talking about pornography here, he says it shall not cleave to me. If you notice in your, your uh, lesson notes there, Deuteronomy 13, 17, it says there shall cleave not of the cursed thing to thine hand. It cleaves to an individual. It's, destroy a marriage, just engage in that pornography. You want to insult your wife, engage in pornography. You want to hurt your wife as bad as you can possibly hurt her, engage in pornography. It's a terrible, terrible, wicked sin. The Bible says leave and to cleave, and that is the extent of, of, the, of the activity. All of this other, whether it's through the mind or the eyes or whatever, God says, beware of it, don't come near it, it will cleave unto you. Deuteronomy 4.4 4 says, but ye did cleave unto the Lord your God and are alive, every one of you. We're, we are to cleave, uh, we are to cleave to God here. Okay, uh, in, in Genesis uh, 2.24, he says, cleave unto his wife, not just unto a woman, but unto his wife. That was, that was the admonition that was given, that was given to, uh, to Adam here. And um, uh, the, the marital union then is described as cleaving, becoming one flesh, being bone of my bone, and flesh of my flesh. This is how God views marriage cleaving, one flesh, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. In other words, becoming one, one unit. Cleaving, uh, cleaving in such a way that you become one unit. When I was in the 10th grade in high school, uh, I had a um, machine shop class. And I learned one of the most amazing things in that machine shop class. And I don't really understand it, but it's a physical law and it's operative today. The teacher told us, he says, if you take two pieces of, in this case he used metal, he says, if you take two pieces of metal and, you, and they are perfectly flat. Now we don't have any metal that is perfectly flat. But he says, if you take two pieces of metal that are perfectly flat and you put them together, they will cleave together and you can't separate you can't pull them apart the only way you can get them apart is you, you slide them apart okay and so he said this is the project that we're gonna we're gonna work on and he give us each a piece of metal metal, metal sheet and he says uh, here we have a, a flat piece of metal here 
And he says, I want you to make this metal as nearly 100% flat as you possibly can. And you'll know when you get it there because it's going to stick to this other, uh, to, the, uh, to the other piece of metal here. And so the way you do it, he'd give us, a, we all had a scraper and uh, he just had this purple dye, I remember that. And you, you rub it on the thing and then you rub it against the, or you, you, you put it on the flat piece of metal, the purple dye, then you, you take the piece he gave you, and you rub it over it and then all the high spots, you got the, the purple dye on it. And so you take this scraper and you scrape and scrape, just, just little small scrapes, nothing, no big gouging out or anything like that. You just scrape it, you're working, you're trying to get, you're trying for perfection. And you scrape and scrape and scrape and you think you got it here. I remember, I know when I started on my sheet, I had just a few purple spots. And I thought, oh, hey, this is gonna be a snap. I just knocked down a few of these high spots and I'll be there. So I, I did that, put it back, inked up the flat sheet, inked, put it back, put my sheet on, I, and, and my piece on it, I got it back again. And I had a whole lot of purple. What had happened? Well, I had knocked off the highest points, but there was still a whole lot more. And so you scrape and you scrape, and I don't know how long we worked on that in the class. And finally we get it to the place, and as he, the teacher told us, you can't make it perfect. But it gets to the place where you put the two pieces of metal together and they cleave together. They are stuck together. Now when God said to Adam, I will make a helpmeet for him, the literal word there is a help fit. Uh, that doesn't mean she's supposed to give him fits. It means that they're supposed to fit together, the husband and wife, okay? So how do you, how do, you do that? So you need to cleave together, but there's high spots. There's these high spots, they gotta be taken off. And maybe you think, well, there's just a few. And so you scrape a little bit and you try it again and oh, well, uh, there's a f more than I thought here. And you keep doing this. Okay, this is the responsibility of the husband. He has to make it fit. He has to make the marriage between him and his wife fit so they can cleave together and become one flesh. Now, it wasn't all that long ago in this country that we had laws that were called common laws. And it had to do with couples living together. And these uh, common laws, uh, I think it was, if I remember correctly, Seven years, if, if a man and a woman without the benefit of marriage lived together seven years, the law said that she was legally, they were legally married. And there was community property then and, and so forth. After seven years, one or the other could not, couldn't just walk away. They were legally married. Now those common laws have been abolished long ago as the morality of our nation has rapidly declined. But her husband was called a common law husband and the wife was called a common law wife. I remember as a boy, a family moved in next door to us. I was pretty young then. And um, my mom and dad, they, uh, talk, you know, they talked to them and everything. And, and um, I remember it was summertime, my, my dad and my mom were sitting on the front porch and I was out there. And uh, this lady from next door, she walks by. And she looks up and she smiles. My dad, he's a bit of a Pharisee. Um, he, <laughs> I inherited it, see, it's, it's in my genes. And uh, he, he just turns his head, wouldn't even look at her. And I thought, boy, he's really impolite. I said, why'd you do that? And he says to me, there's some things that you are too young to understand. <laughs> and I found out later that uh, this was why they weren't married together. They, they, were living, they were living together. That was a very rare thing back in those days. And today it's a very, it's a very commonplace thing. So um, here we see this religious gathering and it turned, into, uh, it turned into an orgy. The Bible says we're to cleave unto our, unto our wives. All right, now going to the last page here. Deuteronomy 10.20 says, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God 
Him shalt thou serve, and to him shalt thou cleave and swear by his name. Man is to cleave to his wife and to the Lord. And the husband's responsibility is make it fit. It's a help fit here. Make it fit. You got to knock off the high spots to, to make it fit here. Romans 12, 9 says, let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, and cleave to that which is good. Okay, we cleave to our mate, cleave to the Lord, cleave to that which is good. And then he says, I, I will make a, a helpmate for him. And in 2 Corinthians 6.14, warns us about the unequal yoke. You can't make it fit. It won't fit. The scripture says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Because it, it won't fit. You can, you can scrape the metal all you want. It'll never, ever, ever fit. It don't work. The book of Amos says, can, can two walk together except they be agreed? So, you know, the unequal yoke, now that unequal yoke can be a, a business arrangement, or it could be a marriage, it be any kind of a union, but it doesn't work. The, uh, one person saved and the other person is lost. And you can't make it fit no matter how hard you try. It's, a, it's like uh, the Bible says in the Old Testament not to hitch up an ox and an ass together to plow a field. You know why? Because the walk is different. The stride is different. The ox has one stride and the ass has another stride. And to, to hitch them up together, the, the, the plow is gonna be going like this instead of in a straight line. Two cannot walk together except that they be agreed. So the, the, the husband's duty, you gotta make it fit. First Peter 3, 7, likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. God says to the husband and to the wife, make it fit, keep working together until it cleaves together, that even your prayers be not hindered. So God has elevated the status of the marital union by the one flesh, and the cleaving together, he's elevated it so much higher above the world standards, which we said is constantly, continuously changing it all the time. God has elevated it up there, and we need to follow the standard that God says, don't let the world set the standard that we live by. Okay, now before we're dismissed, we have a marriage quiz for you here. Um, if there was a marriage between the FedEx Corporation and UPS. What would they call it? Fed up. Fed up. Fed up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's look to God in prayer and we'll be dismissed. Now, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence here and thank you, Lord, for the instruction booklet of how to have a happy marriage called the Holy Word of God. And Lord, we pray that we might heed it and read it and abide by it. Lord, help us to work and make it fit as we cleave one to another, all to the glory of God, because this is a picture of your church. And Lord, we're so thankful to be part of your church in whom the building fitly frames together and groweth into a holy habitation unto the Lord. Dismiss us with your blessing now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming, and we'll see you, Lord willing, next week. <laughs> <laughs>